Welcome to the Sophie Teuber Art Exhibition, Living Abstraction. We are here in the Kunstmuseum Basel and I'm about to give you a veritable behind the scenes tour of our exhibition because you'll see that there are still temporary labels, the light is still a bit too bright and you will hear voices in the backgrounds and maybe see some of my colleagues um, still working on making this exhibition look really, really beautiful for the public. We are ab about to open this exhibition, but for the moment this is still um, like a work in progress, you'll see. Sophie Teuber Arp should be known as one of the foremost artists in the early 20th century but she has not been really inscribed into the canon yet. And we are about to change that with this exhibition tour, which is about to open here at the Kunstmuseum Basel due to the corona circumstances. And then we have two other venues, one in London at Tate Modern and one in New York, the leading um, institution for this exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. Sophie Teuber Arp is quite difficult to grasp and I think that um, the fact that she has not yet been really inscribed into the canon internationally, although she's already um, quite well known in her native Switzerland, may be due to the fact that she was trained as an applied artist and only later on in the late 20s and early 30s moved on to become a like full-blown abstract artist. So people and also art historians maybe have struggled with the fact that she's bridging this traditional divide between the applied arts and fine art. But that I think is actually something that makes her so incredibly interesting also in our times where we are revisiting the canon, where we are re revisiting the categories that we have built and that people sometimes just don't fit into. So what we are doing here is present her in her full glory and really show her work from the early 20th century where she created these wonderful tiny beaded bags as an applied artist with beautiful colors, very colorful composition of abstract motifs. And then at the end you'll get to know her as a, one of the most um, incredible really um, abstract artists in the early 20th century. So. Look at these um, abstract motifs here and the squares and rectangles with which she decorates this object, which is a beaded bag in which you were supposed to put tiny supplies and, and to carry them around on your wrist. Sophie Teuber Arp received her formation in St. Gallen, which at the time was a center for the textile arts and um, a stronghold also for Swiss economy. And then she moved on to study at the very well-known Depschitz Schule in Munich. Um, interesting here is that she was accepted there as a woman. That, that was not common at the time. Many schools were still restricted to only um, host male students. But at the Depschitz Schule in, Mün München, uh, in Munich, she actually was able to work as, an, as a woman. So she created in around 1918 until 1920, Lots of these um, wonderful um, beaded bags. Also prior to that, she, she designed these very abstract shapes and forms that from our time may look like full-blown abstract art. In this case, for example, you wouldn't have guessed that this was a folding screen in its first life. But then later on, Sophie Teuber Arp herself in the 30s decided to exhibit two of these panels as independent abstract works. So already during her lifetime, the artist herself decided to take another look at her own early production, exhibit it in a different way, and then inscribe it in a way into the history of the development of early abstraction. So this is a hugely important and, and quite interesting shift in the way the artist looks at her own work and the way we look at her own work in installing this triptych in this room as a full-blown work of abstraction. But as I said, it began its life probably as a folding screen. The designs that Sophie Teuber Arp created are similarly something that, that shifts its shape, you could say, because she created um, wonderful pencil drawings that to our eyes nowadays look really, really abstract. You basically see these columns of 
shifting, changing colors, and there is nothing that reminds you of shapes in reality, of like um, trees or something as you still saw in the beaded bags. Um, but they are designs for works of the applied arts, and she didn't exhibit them as works in their own um, right until way later. We are now moving on to a very interesting phase um, where, she became, where she came in touch with the Dadaists. The Dadaists, of course, are these um, artists that are anti-bourgeois. And Sophie teuber arp when she returned to Munich in 1914 at the outbreak of the First World War, she um, got to know her later husband, Hans Arp, who also is a very well-known artist. And then in 1918 in Zurich, she created this wonderful set of marionettes for a theater in Zurich. And um, these marionettes belong to the most amazing, well, they are among the most amazing works of classic modern art. They are created from turned wood after the design by Sophie Teuber Arp. And as you can see, they are, these, these um, shapes basically are very geometrical. Prior to that moment, they used to be carved from wood. So this is a huge step into the conception, basically, of how a puppet or how a marionette should look like. And the most amazing work here in this ensemble really are these um, guards. You can see that they form a military unit. They are many, but they are also one. And this is like a war machine, a battle machine of some sort. And looking at it with our contemporary eyes, you're astonished that this is something that was created in 1918. Um, although against the backdrop of the First World War, maybe it's not that astonishing at all. But it's the, it's the age of um, a mechani mechanicized war. And today, maybe we are also thinking about robots and drones. The time, the backdrop of Dadaism, in which um, Sophie Teuber Arp and Hans Arp circleized in these circles, becomes very apparent in another work of art that Sophie Teuber Arp created. It's a Dada head. You see one of the Dada heads here in this historic photograph that Sophie Teuber Arp herself had taken. And you see something like a humorous portrait of her husband, her later husband, whom she married in 1922. Hans Arp here in this tiny head. You see that um, the eyebrows are lifted and he has um, quite a menacing gaze here and this abstract um, part of wood that, that protrudes from the form that is something that, that we now read as a nose. But all in all, it's, um, it's like an abstract, abstract head. Sophie Teuber Arp started in 1916 to actually teach at a school of applied arts at the, uh, at the Zurich Trade School. And there she taught a whole class of young women how to well, bead and, and, and how to do needlework. And um, we actually have one of the most wonderful works from these, um, uh, which is a tapestry here on the wall, which she exhibited in 1925 at the famous exhibition that gave us the term of Art Deco in Paris. So here, here you see one of the tapestry that, uh, tapestries that Sophie Teuber Arp created in all its glory. You again see these um, abstract motifs of triangles that are stacked here. You have a checkboard pattern that is here. And then below that, you see a, like a tiny face with huge blue eyes. Um, peeking out from, from under this checkboard pattern. And these elements, basically you can ask yourself, like how, how do they come together? Where, did, where does she get her ideas? You already saw the pencil drawings in the first room, but another technique that she employs is working with these fragments. And we put some of them here on the wall next to the, next to the tapestry. And here you find the, the blue circle, which you can see over there. Another instance here is the star-shaped pattern that was then consolidated to the checkboard pattern in the actual work. And also the pink head with the huge blue eyes makes its first apparition here in this fragment. 
So with these fragments, she could play around and uh, recombine them and basically um, uh, jumpstart her imagination and um, yeah, have a, have a combination of sorts that, that's um, modular all, almost in, um, in its way of working. And another um, example I'd like to show you here, for example, looking at this figurine here in the um, vitrine and then looking across the room, you'll find the same shape there, much taller, of course, in this very important um, carpet that she exhibited several times. And that is something that we also um, thematize in this room, that she exhibited, of course, her work in the context of applied arts exhibitions, where she also sold these works. That, of course, made it later on difficult to retrieve them and to find them and to put them in her catalog resume. So after she died through an accident in 1943, five years on, her husband Hans Alp tried to reassemble these works, but they couldn't get basically like a representative um, sample of these applied works of art, um, works of applied art. But she basically um, had sold them and they were distributed and used and sometimes maybe even thrown away because of, um, well, because they, they had just outlived um, their existence and or their purpose. So um, the catalog resume doesn't give a full overview of her production in the applied arts, but it focuses on the abstract works that I'm going to show you in the second half of the exhibition. For us, therefore, it is really important to dedicate the entire first part of the exhibition to her output as an artist in the applied arts and to her Dada years, and then later on move into this phase of, of um, abstract art in, in the Paris circles of Cercle et Carré and Abstraction Création. What you hear here in the background um, are um, our efforts to actually um, find a visual language, how to bring together the worlds of applied arts and the fine arts, and how to make that apparent in the rooms. So we are working with this dark floor that um, finds its extension into, in, into the dark walls. And in a way, this for us is a stand and for these two areas of the arts that, that are brought together here in the museum space, abstract art and, and um, the applied arts. The scenography was done by Juliette Israel, who is a Munich-based scenographer. And we've also worked with people who've, who've um, done film productions for once to bring the marionettes to lives. Um, we there worked with Anita Hugi and Marina Rumjanseva from um, Narrative Boutique. And in the last room, you'll see um, we worked with Herbert Schwarze um, from uh, Maze Pictures to have like a sort of biography, an experimental biography by Sophie Teuber, of Sophie Teuber Arps. Here, I want to show you um, Sophie Teuber Arp as someone who designs interiors. So um, Hans Arp, whom she married in 1922, uh, as I already said, um, moved to Strasbourg actually to obtain French citizenship. And Sophie Teuber Arp visits him often and once he gets the French citizenship, she also becomes a French citizen. And um, in these Strasbourg years, she receives a number of important commissions and um, works as an interior designer and later on also creates furniture. So the middle section of the exhibition is dedicated to, the, to these um, designs and this output. In this case, um, we see a design, a gouache design, which is a water-based medium for um, the entrance hall of the Heimendinger residence. 
and you see that these are like abstracted, uh, abstract figures with their um, arms lifted like that, and that's these angular shapes, figures with angular shapes. Um, that, that's something that you see in the entire room, whether you look at this work or at the designs for um, another apartment for the architect and, and pharmacist Paul Horn, which he created. And here you have the design and a, a glass, a stained glass window, again with these figures with lifted arms. Um, so that's basically what she's starting in the late 20s working as an uh, interior designer also, and in an architectural setting, you could say. And we are now moving across the room to look at photographs that she took during her extensive travels. Because keep in mind, um, they, um, Sophie Teuber Arp and Hans Arp, they lived through a period of um, immense creativity that was, um, created also due to the fact that so, so many artists from all over Europe had moved to neutral Switzerland at the outbreak of the First World War in uh, 1914. So Sophie Teuber Arp and her husband basically got to know um, each other at that time. And then after the First World War visit, uh, finished, they um, basically, well, not lost their friends, but they had to um, go visit them all over Europe because they had returned to their home countries. So in the 1920s, she travels quite a bit with her husband and also alone. And we see several photographs here and they bear witness to her, um, basically how she looked at um, impressions or the, that she got at that time from um, cities she visited. For example, this was uh, taken on Rügen, and it's like a sea of these chairs that you have on the beach. And it's almost like an abstract pattern. And something that I'd like to imagine that maybe that may have been an influence when she created works like these, although they are, of course, also reminiscent of the, the beautiful bead works that you saw in the first room. So here also you have these like scattered um, colorful squares and rectangles. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a very joyful visual language. And that's something that we also want to reflect in the title, Living Abstraction. It's, it's ne even when she is at her most abstract, it's never a sort of um, ivory tower abstraction, but it's al always something that's animated from within, that has a, a spark of life and, and uh, something quite joyful, actually. With these works, we are not really sure whether they are her first works of fine art without any other purpose, or whether maybe they are created um, still in relation to beaded bags. The most important commission that Sophie Teuber Arp received for Strasbourg was the one for the Obet. And the interior of the Obet is something that you see here in this um, huge wall photograph. The Obet was um, a historical building which was refurbished by the architects, um, the Brothers Horn. And Sophie Teuber Arp was asked to basically remodel the interior with her design, with her abstract designs. Um, you could play billiard there, you could have tea, there was a cafe, there was a bar, um, basically everything to entertain people at the time. Dancing, of course. And um, Sophie Teuber Arp employed her now fully abstract visual language to design um, here, for example, the, a passageway. And what you see in these designs here, they are basically preparatory studies for the five o'clock tea room. For instance, this gouache and this collage. And then at the same time, she returned to the applied arts and without any purpose to be used in the um, actual architecture, she created this um, beautiful texture, this textile work from the same design with the same colors she later employed in the architectural environment. And one look at this wall photograph shows, shows you the historical situation and how she transformed these ideas into space. And um, it must have been quite an experience for the 
um, viewer and, and the visitor at the time because people were used to quite ornamental designs and now they were confronted with these rectangles and, and colorful squares. And um, we know of contemporary visitors uh, uh, and of their reactions that they weren't thrilled at all. Sophie Teuber Arp brought in to help with the project her husband Hans Arp and one of the co-founders of the Dutch art movement, um, The Style, Theo van Duisburg. And they worked together on this huge project for, um, well, basically in the late 20s. And the means and, and the proceeds she received from this commission then allowed her to build their own studio space and house in Clamart, um, basically right next to Paris. And in the next room, we are now seeing how Sophie Teuber Arp moved there um, to the outskirts of Paris and then built her studio space there and became the abstract artist as whom she is now known. She basically, together with her husband Hans Arp, um, moved in, uh, socialized in these circles uh, of the Paris avant-garde, got to know Michel Seufour, who was a leading art critic at the time, and was brought into these artistic circles of um, Cercle et Carré and the successor um, association of artists, um, Abstraction Création. What I'd like to show you is one of our works, uh, which we house here at the Museum Basel, at the Kunstmuseum Basel. Um, and it's something, it, it's, it's one of these wonderful works that basically speaks to her way of, of creating abstract art. She exhibits her first works as a fine artist in 1930, together with Cercle et Carré, with this artist association. And here you see that it's, you, you, Maybe very faintly you're thinking of some sort of tree of branches, um, but it's basically all about weight and counterweight and optical movement that's induced by colors, shapes and lines. So it's a very agile and very lively art and something that creates movement in the eyes of the beholder. And abstract art nowadays for many people is associated um, with something that they don't understand that's very hermetic as an experience, as a visual experience. But at the time it's really important to stress that these artists considered themselves um, to have created an, a universal language, something that can be understood by everybody and not something that was elitist or removed from um, daily experience. So, that's something that shifted in the perception of abstract art during the last hundred years, you could say. Her uh, business card at the time expressly mentions that she's creating furniture and interior designs. So at the time, although she's already exhibiting as a fine artist, she also wants to establish herself, uh, as, herself as an artist of, of, uh, well, who works with interiors. And something that I just have to show you is this interior of a cupboard um, for which we have a pencil design here on the wall. Just basically as a fun fact. Um, this was created for the House Bitter, another um, commission she received. And look at how tidy this interior of these um, cupboards really look. So it it's just goes to show that she was a very practical sort of artist also. And I should have mentioned in the, in the fourth room um, that she, with her income from, the, um, from her teaching position in Zurich, actually provided for herself and her husband for the next 12 years. So just uh, until this moment when they both moved to Paris, that's the moment when she also resigns her teaching position in Zurich. This practical way of thinking is something that is um, wonderfully reflected in her modular furniture that she created. This beautifully designed um, table and over here you have a stack of shelves. And the wonderful thing here is think back to the work she, she worked, um, to the way she worked with these modular um, fragments and, and used to recombine them. This is a modular shelf. And if you're aware of the, the designs, the usual design at the time, again, the most ubiquitous was like ornamentation and, and, and stuffy interiors. 
but she was part of this avant-garde movement um, that had um, hubs all over Europe, like the Bauhaus, for example, but also in France, where artists and designers and architects tried to modernize life in all its aspects and all its ways. And living was, of course, the most central, the most important aspect to be modernized. The way of living, not in, in, in stuffy interiors, but with these very clear forms and bold colors and um, no ornamentation at all. So very practical also if you have to keep, keep the floor clean and, and this is something where you could um, easily clean the floor um, underneath. Anyway, we're now moving on to one of the probably most beautiful rooms in the entire exhibition with entirely abstract designs that shows Sophie Teuber Arp at the height of her career as an abstract artist. We are taking a quick, quick peek into this vitrine here because we have um, laid out two of the um, issues of the magazines from these two artists groups that I mentioned, Cercle et Carré with this very cool um, design and Abstraction Création. These artists at the time were also um, already battling with, uh, with an increasingly hostile situation towards modern and um, abstract art throughout Europe, you could almost say. Um, France was one of the last uh, safe havens, maybe Great Britain, but you had um, in the meantime dictatorial regimes in, in Russia and you had a dictatorial regime, of course, in Germany and they were already fighting abstract art and modern art because um, with this sort of art always comes attached a way of thinking that is much too liberal and much too um, free-spirited um, for the likings of any dictator. So these artists' associations had positioned themselves as free, spirit, uh, free spirits, as people who didn't want to be restricted by ideology or even racism. And this sort of um, abstract universal language is exemplified in Sophie Teuber Arp's works in the 1930s. And it is absolutely breathtaking to see how positive and life affirming her art remains, although um, dark clouds are already forming over Europe. And, and we all know how um, history turned out and that we are now really on the threshold almost of the, the Second World War. That is something that we are um, firmly keeping in mind, speaking about this exhibition and thinking about Sophie Teuber Arp, uh, Arp's art, um, that she lived through all these crises. Um, her art barely reflects it, um, at least on the surface, but the, the, the core basically is something that's life-affirming. And um, that is something that's incredibly astonishing for me. And, and also looking back from, from basically our um, corona-stricken times, that is a message, I think, that needs to be out there. She worked through these, um, well, several crises, uh, crises from the f outbreak of the First World War to the um, economic crisis of the 1920s. Um, through a flu pandemic in 1918, which restricted the appearances of her marionettes to just three instances, for example, because the exhibitions and the theaters was, were closed at the time, much like today. And then, of course, the outbreak of the Second World War and um, the need to, to flee France um, prior to Nazi occupation. Anyway, here you Looking at this work, you almost get another architectural impression because you could think of these divisions here and, and this layout as, as like a bird perspective on an architectural space. But also it's, it's a wonderful example of how she divides the canvas almost evenly, but not quite, how she leaves this lower half um, right uh, here basically unpainted. Uh, and, and, and void. And then you have these lively aspects here with black and white um, interchanging and then um, shapes that are sometimes like negative and, and then positive shapes. And that's something that's all brought into an, a perfect equilibrium without ever being symmetrical. And that's basically like the, the formula 
um, are the, the secret recipe for all her abstract art. This, for example, is another instance of these um, spaces, um, uh, the, these pictures that are divided in, in six spaces, but it's not done as um, obviously as in the other work. And here you have several lines that basically go through the entire composition and, and interconnect um, these uh, separate spaces. But what I really want to show you in this room are these stacks of shapes that are almost reminiscent of, um, for example, Donald Judd or minimal art. And it's just astonishing to, to look at um, the restraint with which she paints these, um, how, how did we translate them, um, echelon mont, well, gradations. They are stacked on top of each other. They are similar, but never identical. They are in constant movement, but they are also brought to a sort of um, stability. It is, it is quite striking to have these designs here next to each other, one gouache, so again this water-based medium, and these two paintings, one with colorful shapes and this incredibly elegant and, and um, restrained design where you just have the white shapes on blue um, background. It's also the, sh the um, work that we chose for the cover of our catalog. In this eighth room, I want to introduce you to another work at the Kunstmuseum Basel, which belongs to the most important of Sophie Teuber Arp's output in the 1930s. Um, this is the, um, well, Cercle Mouvementé, um, the animated circle picture. This work was actually shown in an exhibition um, in 1937, at which Sophie Teuber Arp was the most important um, artist. She had 24 works representing her, more than any other artist that participated. And the poster, the contemporary poster at the time, actually shows you that um, the participating artists were a real who is who of the abstract avant-garde at the time. Just look at that. Van Doesburg und Demela, Egeling, Naum Gabo, Kandinsky, you know, of course, Elisitsky, Molinoj, Mondrian, Pevsner, and so on. And here comes Teuber, and then Van Tan Tangalo and Vordenberger, Gildewart, and many others. So we are now speaking about the moment where, um, in this room, basically, which is dedicated to this exhibition in 1937, that was shown at the Kunsthalle Basel. Georg Schmidt was a co-curator at the time. Two years on, he became the director of the Kunstmuseum Basel. And what is striking about this exhibition really is that the, the abstract art that was shown here, the constructivist um, designs that you see here, are um, framed by Georg Schmidt in his opening speech in these terms of utopian, um, optimistic, life-affirming, exactly um, the way that I think Sophie Teuber Arp would, would have described her work. Um, on this wall we put these fabulous reliefs that she cre created um, prior to the opening of, of the exhibition in 1936, around that time. And what you can see if you follow me closely here, just be careful. <laughs> um, here you see from the side that these are um, cylinders. But once you look from the, from the front, you see that um, the, the, basically the basis of the cylinders sometimes is painted and suddenly you have these colorful circle, uh, circles. So basically something that was apparent in Sophie Teuber Arps for quite a while now, working with these like um, colorful circles. But now they are suddenly just the top of a three-dimensional form of a, um, yeah, so that's, that's something that's really new and, and quite exciting to see because art historically speaking, you could say that these reliefs position her somewhere between um, cubist reliefs and again, minimal art, where it's all about perception and the, the viewpoint of the beholder. That's something that, um, yeah, I could be speaking about for hours. It's, it's hugely interesting anyway. Um, and this uh, relief here even has a, a very fancy optical effect one of letting this black circle vanish in front of the also black um, basis of, the, of this black plate. And once you move to the side and look at it from here, you see that it's, it's basically the basis, the painted basis of a cone. 
So this goes to say that she's experimenting with the, the three-dimensionality of these works, the three-dimensional, um, well, optical effects almost, and something that's, uh, well, just incredible at the time and, and, and very, very new and, and um, striking. And speaking of the circle as an important shape in Sophie Teuber Arp's oeuvre, here we have um, installed two of these fabulous round reliefs where the circle becomes the, the um, decisive form and shape of these entire reliefs. And here also she thinks in layers and she combines these shapes and then stacks them on top of each other and it all works together. When you move to the side you get, get a different impression when you move here and then you just look at it from the front and but you still have this optical um, depth and dimension uh, within the work. We're now moving into the last room of our exhibition, but it's important to keep in mind the circumstances. In 1940, Sophie Teuber-Arp and her husband Hans Arp had to flee Paris for the south of France because the Nazi invaders were close to um, occupying the city. And, um, on the move, basically, they, they made a, a short stop in Verrier, uh, where Peggy Guggenheim had a house at the time. And then they moved on and settled in Grasse, where they met artists' friends. Um, the supplies were scarce, food was scarce, money was scarce. It was, it was a time of incredible, um, yet yeah, just restraint, and, and um, they, they almost had nothing to live from. And these works that you see here in the last room on the walls are projects of that time, and they give a sense of, of nomadic restlessness also. She creates these tiny, or well, basically made of mo in a moderate format, these, these uh, drawings from pencil that are in, in their technique reminiscent of the abstract works that you saw in the first room, which were designs for the applied arts. But here um, you get the sense of, of nomadic restlessness in the design. And um, she also works on two projects with her husband Hans Arp, who has created um, books with his poems and she's illustrating them. So these are basically the last works that she creates and in this room they are installed all over in these clouds because there are many of them and but she also creates um, almost no um, no paintings anymore because she just doesn't have the supplies. Um, they apply for a visa to um, flee to the United States. The visa is granted, but they decide against leaving Europe after all. So in 1943, on a temporary visa, both of, uh, both of them are able to escape the occupation of southern France by the National Socialists and temporarily move back to Zurich. She's staying at her sister's house and Hans Arp is staying with their artist friend, Max Bill. And in one cold January night, um, Sophie Teuber Arp decides not to leave for her sisters but stay at Max Bill's house also. She sleeps in the guest room and she activates the stove but forgets that the flu is shut. So she dies of carbon, minus, um, carbon monoxide poisoning during the night in her sleep. And it's very important to just stress that this last room is not showing her at the height of her artistic career, but with a sort of, um, just to keep the, the circumstances in mind. The question that we were posing here basically is what would she have gone on to do? How would she have maybe translated these designs into paintings? And it's, it's a sort of, um, elegiac feeling that you get in this last room, something um, almost sad and, and melancholic because it's, it's a hard artist that was taken from life so suddenly and um, just without giving us uh, closure. We've now come to the end of our tour. Thank you so much for your interest and um, see you at the Kunstmuseum Basel. <laughs>